Yeah, welcome to uh, day two and this talk on endogenous macrodynamics and algorithmic recourse. My name is uh, Patrick Altmaier. I'm a PhD student at TU Delft. Uh, this is our library, probably the most beautiful building. <laughs> and this is joint work with uh, Jovan Angela, Alexander Bujitlik, uh, Karol Dobyshek, all students at TU Delft, and also my two PhD supervisors, uh, Ari van Dersen and Cynthia Liam. So we already had a, a great talk on counterfactuals yesterday, but just to briefly recap, counterfactual explanations uh, explain how inputs into a model need to be changed or perturbed uh, for the model to produce different outputs. And this is typically done through gradient descent in the feature space, uh, much like adversarial examples are generated. Sorry, yeah. And provided that these uh, changes are realistic, plausible, and, and also actionable, uh, they can be used for the purpose of what we call algorithmic recourse, or also referred to as uh, individual recourse, uh, which involves um, helping individuals who face a negative outcome in some real world uh, decision making scenario. And to give you some more intuition here, I've taken an example from our paper. <clears throat> so here we have. A binary classifier that was trained um, by some retail bank to assess the credit worthiness of their uh, applicants. In blue, uh, we have sampled, uh, randomly sampled some counter, some, some factuals that initially were classified as too risky to receive a loan. And in orange, you can see their corresponding uh, valid counterfactuals. So at that state, um, these individuals uh, in the eyes of the black box model are considered as, as credit worthy. And quite intuitively, I think for most of them, um, the counterfactuals are characterized by a higher level of income. And we have imposed here in terms of uh, actionability that the age variable can all, only be mutated in the positive direction. But of course you might still ask how plausible is this counterfactual really? And how ethical is it perhaps to suggest that uh, individuals increase their, their income or their age. And these are exactly the kind of uh, questions that the literature on algorithmic recourse uh, centers around. But let's park these concerns for a moment and just think the story through a step further. We've asked ourselves, what actually happens when we implement recourse, not just for a single individual, but a group of individuals? And what we find is that uh, counterfactuals using various state-of-the-art counterfactual generators actually induce quite substantial domain and, and resulting uh, model shifts. And in light of this, we propose a novel perspective on algorithmic recourse that explicitly uh, addresses this uh, issue, this cost that we see to, to arise. And we've open sourced all our code in a, in a Julia package that can be used to study the dynamics that I'll uh, illustrate in, in a second. So zooming into this uh, plot that you've perhaps already looked at now, we start again from this baseline situation where the retail bank is uh, using some black box model to distinguish uh, credit worthy individuals here in the, in the top uh, left corner in blue from uh, individuals that are too risky in orange to, to receive credit. Now, the bank uh, has actually provided algorithmic recourse to some individuals here um, that have moved from the non-target domain across the decision boundary into a state where they are uh, considered by the black box model as, as valid, as credit worthy. But of course, they look different from individuals that were originally in the, in the target domain. So this group up here is quite easily distinguishable from, from this group. So we have a, a domain shift. And we consider this domain shift as endogenous because it's triggered by the application of recourse itself. It's not due to some exogenous force that's exerted on the system. Next, we assume that the bank goes ahead and retrains the classifier simply based on the notion that in practice organizations uh, retrain their models regularly. And you can see by the fact that you can now actually make out these dots here, that the decision boundary has shifted in the direction of the non-target class. And this is what we refer to as an endogenous model shift. And 
Next, we go ahead in our experiments and repeat this procedure a number of times. So recourse is implemented, the model is retrained, and we end up with this highly exaggerated uh, image here. Um, but for illustrative purposes, what we find here in this proof of concept is that the group of borrowers that ultimately receives credit uh, is much more uh, risky. The average default risk has increased. So there's some, some costs that we have generated through the application of recourse that we would like to avoid. So a number of questions arise here, really. Firstly, who should bear this, this cost that we have generated? Secondly, and relatedly, are the counterfactuals that we have generated genuinely valid in practice? So you could imagine that the bank, as soon as it realizes that, uh, okay, I have provided algorithmic recourse, but now um, my average default risk has increased, might refuse to provide recourse to future uh, would-be borrowers. And then that cost is kind of transferred to those future borrowers who no longer receive recourse. There are also questions about security, fairness, and privacy. Uh, clearly, we can distinguish these individuals from, from other individuals in the domain. So this gives rise to, to further discrimination of these individuals. Now, this was our proof of concept. Now let's take this to the data. Our first challenge was to come up with a set of uh, metrics to actually measure these domain and model shifts. And both Alexander and Carol have come up with some really good ideas here, which I'm sure they're happy to discuss with you during the poster session. We use both black box models, deep neural networks and deep ensembles, but also uh, linear classifiers. And we take this proof of concept to both synthetic data uh, of various degrees of complexity, as well as uh, real world data sets, all of them from the economics and finance domain. In terms of counterfactual generators, we start with the baseline generator proposed by Wart et al. We also use uh, Revise, which uses a surrogate uh, generative model to generate realistic plausible counterfactuals. We've also looked at DICE to generate uh, diverse counterfactuals. And also finally, a greedy approach that works with uh, Bayesian classifiers. So our deep ensembles uh, here. And these are some of our uh, principal findings. So on the left, you can see how over time, so as the procedure is repeated, um, we, we, we observe quite substantial domain shifts for all of our uh, considered counterfactual generators. And consequently, we also observe a deterioration in out of sample uh, model performance here measured in terms of the F1 score on, on a holdout set. And these are quite substantial values. So we have a decrease in the F1 score of up to um, four percentage points. For the real world data, as you can see in just a moment, uh, in some cases it goes uh, even even deeper, even lower, um, so up to 10% uh, percentage points uh, reduction. So across the board, we observe substantial shifts. Now, what, what do we do about it? Um, to find answers to this uh, problem, we revisited the uh, gradient-based uh, gradient recourse framework. It starts from, from this equation here, which to those of you studying adversarial examples uh, should look familiar. So the goal is to, to flip the label. But here we, in, in the context of recourse, we introduce this, this penalty, which ensures that the costs to the individual are minimized. And, and costs in, in the baseline setting um, are, are typically proxied by the distance that the individual uh, has to travel to move to a valid counterfactual state. But as we've seen, this focus on individual cost comes at an additional cost, um, in which we measured in terms of, of model performance and domain shifts. So to make this explicit, we propose to, to, to include this additional penalty term here, which we refer to as external cost. And I'll explain to you in a moment um, what exactly we mean by that. So the concept of uh, negative externalities is borrowed from uh, economics. A negative externality is a cost um, that is generated by some economic agent, but it is not necessarily suffered by that same agent. So you can think of a factory that causes pollution, 
but it doesn't pay the price for that pollution. So society as a whole suffers from that external cost, but the factory itself is not affected immediately. And we think that this maps to, to our, um, our course, course framework and our examples quite well, as I've uh, illustrated in this rather remarkable cartoon. Um, so again, we start with the situation that the bank is using some uh, black box model to discriminate uh, borrowers from, from people that won't receive credit. It provides recourse to, to an, an individual, but then it realizes that it's generated a cost for, for itself. Uh, and in our original example, and also here, we assume that the bank uh, bears this cost. Uh, but as I already hinted earlier, we can imagine scenarios where the cost is simply passed on uh, to consumers, to, to borrowers. We propose several um, simple and, and quite ad hoc uh, mitigation strategies based off that notion of external costs and that, that penalty term that we introduced. I want to highlight the second and third one here. So classifier preserving raw is based off of this paper, um, which introduced robust algorithmic recourse. It works under the notion of uh, penalizing classifier loss and loss with respect to the generated counterfactual. So we want to minimize the, the impact that the generated counterfactual has on the model when, when it's retrained. So that's the, the right panel here. And we can see that the counterfactual due to this additional penalty moves deeper into the target domain. The gravitational generator instead is based on the promise, uh, premise of uh, identifying and determining some, some sensible point in the target domain and having the counterfactual gravitate towards that point. So it kind of explicitly addresses the idea of avoiding domain shifts. And here are our results. So we do find that all of our strategies are quite effective at, at mitigating uh, the observed domain shifts here shown on the left, and also the resulting uh, reduction in, in, in out of sample model performance here shown on the right. So to summarize our key takeaways, we find that various state-of-the-art approaches to algorithmic recourse induce substantial domain and model shifts. And we look at this as an external cost of individual recourse. And this notion gives rise to an uh, additional penalty term uh, and very easy and simple uh, ad hoc solutions. But as I said multiple times, the approaches that we do propose are quite ad hoc and quite simple. Um, but I think they give rise to very interesting uh, ideas for future cross-disciplinary uh, research. For example, we could think of something like Pareto optimal algorithmic recourse, which means that we would have um, a situation where no individual can be made better off without making another individual worse off. And finally, I'll just leave you with this slide here that kind of summarizes the uh, broader broader topic of my PhD. Uh, so in our team, we work on methodologies and open source tools to help researchers and practitioners to assess the trustworthiness of uh, the predictive models that they deploy. Uh, we have built and presented uh, various packages. Um, in particular, I want to highlight counterfactual explanations, which was presented at JuliaCon last year uh, and can be used to both implement and benchmark counterfactual generators. And Based off of that, um, we also introduced with this paper uh, algorithmic recourse dynamics, which can be used to uh, generate the kind of dynamics that we discussed today. And with that, um, I'll open the floor to questions.